Welcome to Church Online. My name is Miles. I'm the new Disciple and the Young Minister here at St. James. So good to be with you today. So good to be gathering, although in a weird way, but still exciting. Still good to be part of our community. We have so much for you today. We have uh, our senior pastor, Al, giving us a couple updates. We have a story of grace with Jerry and Sandy. And we're also checking in with Lockie and Rach. Now, we're doing a new series at the moment called Amazing Grace. Uh, and there's some really exciting things that are a part of that. Uh, one of those is our devotions that we've uh, written for this series. You can find those on our website, as well as links to our Zoom morning teas that are happening today. There's so many ways to join in with what is going on. Also later in this service, we'll have singing, which is a great way to worship and enjoy our God together, knowing that all around Croydon and the inner west, there are people who are singing at the same time. What a joy it is to be part of our community at this time. Enjoy church. Hi, St. James. I want to give you an update on what we're thinking about as far as our ministry programs go in the wake of the government's recent announcement. As you're probably aware, the government has set up a three-step framework for Australian communities to return to normal. What does this mean for us? We've been thinking hard about this and we've received guidance from the diocese. It won't surprise you to hear that it means church gatherings are still way off in the future. In fact, disappointingly, even when you're allowed to have up to 100 people, because of the nature of the St. James building, it probably means we still can't meet for church. What about our smaller ministries though, the ones that have smaller groups of people, growth groups in particular? We've really thought about this, but the fact is, None of our growth groups have fewer than five people, which is the limit of visitors that you can have. And the practicalities of almost every St. James home mean that we can't really do safe social distancing in the way the government suggested. And so for the time being, growth groups, including mine, are still online. Having said all that, it won't surprise you to hear that our kids and our youth ministries are also still not returning to face-to-face -to -face programming for the time being. I wish I could tell you something more inspiring. What has inspired me is to hear of the creative ways that St James people are trying to stay connected and to encourage each other. Small groups of two or three going for walks in the park, sharing prayer points and praying before they go home. The challenge for us is not to say, what can we not do yet, but what can we do that will keep expressing the love of Christ for one another. What I want to do now is turn your thoughts away from the inner west of Sydney to the land of Madagascar. We have good links with Madagascar, as you know, and we're about to see a video from an Anglican minister there called Bertier, who visited St. James last year. He's going to give us an update, especially on how local Anglicans are being affected by the shutdown. You might not have thought of this, but in Madagascar, Anglican clergy are among the most vulnerable members of the community because they only receive payment from what their poor parishioners can spare. On the other hand, they're people that parishioners want to spend time with. Anglican Aid has a support fund which is going to supply both clergy and their parishioners with essential supplies. Let's hear from Bertier. Brothers and sisters of St. James Croydon, greetings from Madagascar. We are now almost two months of lockdown and social distancing, and it has affected our country socially, politically, and economically. And because of that, many Anglican parishes, especially in rural areas, could not afford their clergy, because normally clergy are paid uh, out of the offerings during the month and yet there were no church gatherings. So if there are no church gatherings, there are no offerings, so there are no money to pay uh, clergy or pastors or presbyters. So brothers and sisters of St. James Croydon, on behalf of the Anglican Church of Indian Ocean, the Anglican province of Indian Ocean, kindly support us through Anglican Ed because it will save people's life, it will help clergy, and it will help to encourage clergy here in Madagascar. 
Second, brothers and sisters, kindly pray for us. Pray that clergy and all Christians will remain encouraged to witness the Lord Jesus Christ in this very difficult time. And last, I want to thank St. James Croydon for your partnership. Thank you for all things you have done for us. You have done so much for us. You have been very generous to us. So thank you for all things you have done. And we pray for you that the Lord will encourage you to witness to the Lord Jesus Christ. And we ask you, please kindly keep doing what you do. And may God bless you. And bye for now. Well, the good news for us is a little goes a long way in Madagascar. But it's also true that a lot goes even further. I hope you can participate in this practical act of fellowship with our sisters and brothers in Christ there, as Ruth and I will be doing. You can use the link that's available on the website or on the email that I sent out to everybody in our database. Guys, I'm just here on Liverpool Road. I hope you can hear me outside St. James. So excited to launch Alpha in one week. Now this is a bit better. This is a little bit more what it might be like if your loved one attends Alpha online. Really comfortable place in which they get to share their views, interact with a really high quality video and other people um, as well in that small group that runs for about an hour for six weeks. Uh, we hope this week uh, that at the last week of our prayer challenge that you're not only praying, it's not too late to join in, uh, that you're not only praying but you're inviting this week. Uh, this week is all about prayer alongside invitation. Do send a text or have a phone call with someone uh, who might benefit from Alpha Online. Um, yeah, you can also send them a link to a video about Alpha. You've gotten one in your email this morning if you're watching this on a Sunday. Uh, we're really excited to see how God will use Alpha. It does start in a week. Everyone is welcome. Uh, God has used Alpha really powerfully in the past. We think especially of Alexandra Joseph from our 9 a.m. congregation. Uh, you might know her as Sandy. She shares now about how Alpha is part of her story of grace. Hi, I'm Alexandra from the 9 a.m. service. I first heard about Alpha through my brother. He suggested it might be something that I would enjoy. I didn't really know what to expect when St. James announced that they were going to have the course, but I attended with an open mind. For me, Alpha opened up my eyes about the questions that I had about life and questions I had around the Bible stories. It also helped me to understand just why so many people around the world believe the Bible stories. I learned different perspectives from both Christians and non-Christians alike in an open space. And what I discovered is that we all really had the same concerns. We had concerns about the future of the world and the future for humanity. For years, I've been on a personal journey or trying to find myself, as they say, and through God's grace, Alpha helped me to learn more about myself and discover who I am. Alpha also gave me the opportunity to connect with the St. James community and to build new relationships and friends. On another note, the course is very well structured. Each group has a facilitator to ensure that everybody is able to share their view and to keep the conversations flowing. I hope to see you at Alpha Online 2020. Hi, my name's Lachlan, and this is my wife, Rach. We're members of the 7 p.m. congregation at St. James. I work as a lawyer at Legal Aid New South Wales, and so I started that role in March of this year and went on leave for a week and got back and was told I was working from home. Um, we weren't seeing clients anymore. All of our services and court appearances have turned into telephone appearances and video appearances. So for me, coronavirus has felt particularly unsettling and it's brought with it lots and lots of change. Um, I think for me, I've seen God's grace during this period by church quickly transitioning to being online, um, getting to meet with our Wednesday night growth group, 
has been a real joy and in particular I think for us um, being able to keep going with our um, Sunday night 5.30 senior high growth groups has been so lovely um, and so I think getting to continue to meet with Christian believers whilst work has felt particularly unsettling and not getting to see my friends or my family as frequently as I would like to um, that's been a real act of grace I think by God and something that's been really helpful for me in this time. Work for me has been much the same. I work as a physio at a Sydney hospital. I've enjoyed being able to go into work um, to see my friends and treat patients much the same as I would have before. Um, I've enjoyed the normality despite um, things changing and that for me um, has been helpful. Um, I've also seen God's grace and his blessing um, with my family members nearby. I've been able to visit them um, yeah, often. My sister and my brother-in-law live around the corner with um, our little niece um, and it's been awesome to um, say hello from the other side of the fence and uh, throw a ball, throw a ball um, yeah, from the other side of the fence. Um, and the same with my parents, they live close by and that's been a real blessing to, to see them um, and to yeah, chat about the, what's going on in the world um, and we've really seen God's grace in that. Um, I'm going to lead us in prayer now, so I'd love for you to join me. Kind and gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are good and you are kind. Lord God, we thank you that you are in control of all things and yet you use that control for the good of those who love you. Lord God, we bring our world before you um, and we thank you for the ways that you care for us um, and that you have compassion on a world which desperately needs you. Lord God, we think of the current coronavirus situation um, and Lord God, we do praise you that Australia seems to be um, healing from it and Lord God we thank you for the wisdom you've given our leaders in managing the virus. Lord God we do think of other places in the world um, where coronavirus continues to spread and take many lives. Um, Lord God we pray that you would give leaders wisdom as they seek to tackle the challenge of coronavirus. Um, Lord God we do pray that you would bring healing where there's sickness and hope where there's uncertainty. Lord God, we do pray that where there's grief, you would bring joy. And where there's death, Lord God, we pray that you would bring the gospel to those places, Lord God, that people would know you and place their trust in you. And with that in mind, Lord God, we pray um, that amidst the uncertainty and the grief and the sadness and the death that is facing our world, we pray, Lord God, that you would bring your gospel to the places that need it desperately. We pray that we would be quick to share the hope that we have in Christ Jesus with our friends and our family members and our work colleagues, Lord God. Help us to be quick to share the hope that we have in Christ Jesus. Lord God, we pray that through this, many people would come to trust in you and that they would see that the answer to death and sickness and pain and suffering is Christ rising from the dead and proclaiming victory over those things. We pray this in your son's name, and we pray, Lord God, that you would make each of us more and more like your son, Jesus. Amen. Thanks, Lockie and Rach. Uh, we're about to have some singing. Uh, we're really thankful for our in-house musos who are putting in so much work um, so that we can be singing together. Uh, singing is one of the, the few ways that actually we can kind of unite in this moment where we can sing of our great God together. Although apart, we still have the great joy of getting to sing together.
ransomed me and like a flood his mercy reigns unending love amazing Jesus bled and died for me. I see his wounds, his hands, his feet. My Savior on that cursed tree. His body bound and drenched in tears. They laid him
blazing sun shall pierce the night and I will rise among the saints my gaze transfixed on Jesus As we continue our reflections on the amazing grace of God towards us through the death and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. I want to start by sharing a story with you of something that happened when I had just got my peas. I was driving in a street near my place and I decided to execute a U-turn. Unfortunately, I misjudged my turning circle and quite badly gouged a car that was parked on the far side of the street. It was just near a little row of shops, and as I sat there with my heart pounding, I guessed that the owner of the car was probably just picking up some milk or the paper or something. I felt like I should wait and own up to what I'd done. Sure enough, within a few minutes, a middle-aged man came around the corner and headed for the car. I intercepted him on the footpath and said, excuse me, mate, I've got something I need to tell you. And I ushered him out onto the street and showed him the scratch along the side of his car. He looked at me, and I'm going to pause the story there. (laughs) I will tell you the rest. Because I want to reflect on that sense of having done something wrong that needs correction. We saw last week that the word grace describes the character of God, the fact that he seeks unearned reconciliation with undeserving people. We looked at the parable of the prodigal son. But what specifically does that have to do with you? You might reflect on that parable of the two sons and say, I'm not like the younger son, I haven't messed up my life And I'm not like the older son. I'm not an arrogant person. I'm just normal. In the Bible, the writer who uses the word grace most frequently is Paul. And this week, we look at one of the letters he wrote, the letter of Romans. Do we have any advantage? Not at all. For we have already made the charge that Jews and Gentiles alike are all under the power of sin. As it is written, there is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands. There is no one who seeks God. All have turned away. They have together become worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one. Their throats are open graves. Their tongues practice deceit. The poison of vipers is on their lips. Their mouths are full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Ruin and misery mark their ways, and the way of peace they do not know. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now, we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law. 
so that every mouth may be silenced and the whole world held accountable to God. Therefore, no one will be declared righteous in God's sight by the works of the law. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of our sin. But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made known to which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference between Jew and Gentile, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith. He did this to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. He did it to demonstrate his righteousness at the present time so as to be just and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. Where then is boasting? It is excluded. Because of what law? The law that requires works? No, because of the law that requires faith. For we maintain that a person is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. Or is God the God of Jews only? Is he not the God of Gentiles too? Yes, of Gentiles too, since there is only one God who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through that same faith. He includes this statement from Romans chapter 3, verse 22. There is no difference between Jew and Gentile, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. Now, we're going to look back at this. But if this is true, there is no more important reality for you to engage with in your life. And I want to consider three points today. Sin, grace, and boasting. Sin, grace, and boasting. Well, firstly, sin. In the first century, when Jesus lived, the Jewish people basically divided the entire world into two categories, Jews and non-Jews, or Gentiles, as they called them. The Jews understood themselves to be God's chosen people, and this brought all sorts of privileges. They had the Old Testament law that reflected God's character and guided human behavior. They had his promises of his coming kingdom. Gentiles, on the other hand, were pretty much a lost cause unless they were willing to convert to Judaism. Now, Paul, who wrote Romans, was Jewish. But he says, despite the privileges of being a Jew, before God, Jews and Gentiles are in the same boat because of sin. So he says in Romans chapter 3, verse 9, What shall we conclude then? Do we have any advantage? Not at all. For we have already made the charge that Jews and Gentiles alike are under the power of sin. He even acknowledges the limitations of the wonderful Old Testament law. He says, No one will be declared righteous in God's sight by the works of the law. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of sin. And then he builds up to that statement we heard. There is no difference between Jew and Gentile, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. I wonder, I wonder how deeply we believe that statement, that we have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And if we don't believe it, what would it take to convince us of its truth. 
I remember when I was a teenager going to a, a convention and the speaker said to us, put up your hand if you've never told a lie. At the time I thought, oh yeah, I get what you're saying. But it hardly led to a deep conviction of moral failure. There are so many reasons that we find it hard to accept the idea that we're sinners, or at least sinners in any morally important sense. For one thing, we tend to define sin incredibly narrowly. I periodically have conversations with people about this stuff, and they always say, look, I'm basically a good person. They don't really explain where they get their definition from, but they believe it deeply. I have even had the cliched conversation with someone who said to me, I've never killed anyone. As if, as if that's a passing grade. I mean, would you accept that if you were trying to find a new boyfriend? If someone said, put it this way, I've never killed anyone? Would you accept that if you were looking for a babysitter for your kids? I'm not sure why we think that God should accept a standard like that, that we wouldn't accept in a boyfriend or a babysitter. Or again, we tend to define sin by comparing ourselves with others. Not with God, of course, but generally with people who are like us or worse. Basically, we feel like we can belong to an outlaw motorcycle gang as long as we're the best person in the gang. As long as that's the case, we're not a sinner. Or again, perhaps as I said last week, we have a definition of God that means that sin never happens. Either God is Santa Claus, he doesn't care what we do, he just gives us stuff, or God is a negotiator, in which case there's no such thing as sin in an absolute sense. There's just stuff that you have to pay back. For these and all sorts of additional reasons, people in our culture reject the idea that we have sin as a serious problem. What's the Bible's view of sin? The Bible says sin is an issue of our hearts. Jesus summarised God's claim on our life in the words, love the Lord your God with all your heart and love your neighbour as yourself. It's interesting that Jesus seized on what it is we love. He didn't say, put up your hand if you've never told a lie. He said, what are the things that you are committed to above all? What are the things that you go to for meaning and for purpose in your life? What are the things that motivate your behaviours? What do you love? Romans 1 describes us as worshipping and serving created things rather than the one who created them. This is sin. And it is true of you as it is of me. And this is not something we can just negotiate our way out of. In that statement in Romans 3.23, Paul said, we fall short. It's not that we just have to work harder. We have missed the mark as a result of our sin. And this doesn't have to do with people we find acceptable. I know almost everyone at St. James personally. You're all lovely. You are also all sinful. This is the reality. And according to the Bible, it is a reality of the gravest significance. And just thinking differently about sin does not change it any more than if I had looked at that scratch I made on that car and thought, ah, oh, it's not too bad. That in itself does not change the reality of how bad the scratch is or is not. Falling short of the God to whom we owe our very lives brings death. And again, Paul uses that language in Romans chapter 6, verse 23, when he says, The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Well, that's sin. But what about grace? Let me return to my car story. The man comes back. 
He looks at the scratch. It's horrible. Then he looks at me and he says, you know what? I appreciated that you stayed here to own up to this damage. It's actually a company car. I'll just tell my boss there was no one here when I got back. Now, say what you like about the rights or wrongs of this course of action. I was out of there and I was extremely grateful to the man for what he did. But the point is not that by saying that, nobody had to pay for the scratch. Somebody had to pay for the scratch. And when it comes to your sin, somebody has to pay for it. It's real. And the central news of the Christian gospel is this. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith. That's Romans 3, 23 and following. That's the news of God's grace towards us as sinful people because of the death and resurrection of Jesus. Jesus has given his life to atone for your sin. He does this not as a negotiating move. This is not something that you can repay. This is an act of grace. It's a bit like the father in the parable of the two sons last week, coming out to you and putting the best robe on you and taking you into the feast. It's grace. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. That's Romans 6.23. This is such good news. It means that having made the scratch, as it were, you don't need to flee the scene. You don't even need to pay for it yourself. But you do need to accept the payment of another, the payment that Jesus has made by his death for us. I was hearing on the radio the other day a podcast about the COVID-19 pandemic. And a doctor there was talking about plasma transfusion as a therapy. You might have heard of this. He was saying that people who are just newly recovered from the illness can become plasma donors and that plasma transfusions are very effective in treating acute patients. As a preacher, I saw a sermon illustration here. I thought, imagine that. Or imagine this, imagine that someone were willing to become sick with this horrible and distressing disease simply in order to become a donor for the sake of others. Can you imagine such a thing? I suppose perhaps someone might do it for their wife or for their parent. Can you imagine doing it for a stranger? Two weeks of illness, time in an ICU. Can you imagine doing it for, for an enemy? This is what the Bible says Jesus has done for us. In Romans chapter 5, verse 8, Paul says, God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were sinners, Christ died for us. And that is grace. And to accept that donation, that is faith. Well, I said at the start that I'd finish with a word about boasting. Where does that fit in? A person who knows that they have received grace is changed. The way they speak changes. The way they think about themselves changes. You think about that, that scratch that I made as a pea plater. It's not as if I go through the rest of my life bragging about the fact that when I was a pea plater, I never made an insurance claim. Of course I wouldn't do that. I realise the only reason that is true is because somebody else accepted the cost. And so it is with us. We don't boast. In fact, Paul says in Romans 3.27, 
Where is boasting? It is excluded. Grace humbles us and stops us focusing on our own performance and directs our eyes to Jesus. The same language is used in Ephesians about grace and boasting. Ephesians 2 verse 8 says, It is by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. The sense of gratitude and and our appreciation of the magnitude of grace only deepens as we go on in the Christian life and see more and more what it is that Jesus has done for us. It's as though years later I were to find the receipt for the repairs to that car and what I thought was a $700 damage turned out to be a $4,000 piece of damage. That's what it's like as a Christian to keep looking again and again at what it is Jesus has done for us and to understand it more deeply. When the man writes the song, Amazing Grace, he says it's amazing because he has come to understand that he is a wretch. And the more he understands his wretchedness, the more amazing the grace is for him. Let me finish with another example. The British Prime Minister, Boris Johnson, was elected a number of months ago. He's a conservative politician. And so when he was elected, people started fearing for what his government might do to the National Health Service, the NHS. Would they defund it? Would they undermine it? Uh, He made all the right noises, but nobody was really sure what he had in mind. Then he became sick with COVID-19. Initially, he kept working from home, but eventually he was hospitalised. Some days later, he was moved into ICU. It later emerged that the hospital was starting to think about how they would communicate his death to the wider public. He recovered and was ultimately able to go home. And on the far side of that experience, the NHS has no greater advocate. He just had a baby boy whom he named after two of the doctors who cared for him as NHS doctors in his ICU. When someone has received grace, they look back with fresh eyes. They boast not about their own health, but about the wonders of the one who saved them. Jesus died and rose for you. And for those of us who know this, his grace is a life-saving and life-changing reality. As I finish, can I leave you just with two reflection questions? The first is this. What sense do you have of your own sin? Is that something that you really believe? And secondly, how do you think that affects your sense of the depth of Jesus' grace towards you? What would it mean for you to deepen your understanding of both those things? My sisters and brothers, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen.